Coming up on self at 11, we might have found the perfect light switch for home automators. We jump into the hardware corner and talk about shucking drives. And we give you our favorite self-hosting blogging platforms. Plus, we answer some of your questions. I'm Chris. And I'm Alex. And this is Self-Hosted. Welcome back to Self-Hosted. There's so much we could talk about today, Alex. But I think we'll start with what you love to do. And that's shucking and jiving. So our very own Joe Ressington reached out to me this week asking about hard drives, which should he buy? Is shucking a hard drive good? Is it dangerous? Is he going to lose data? Is it an inferior quality product? I don't know, Chris, you have some experience with this, don't you? I do, thanks to you. I actually was a shuck avoider for quite a while because I I thought maybe they're like slamming their lower grade discs in these cases and selling them to suckers at the average consumer box store. And that kind of crossed my mind. And the other thing was, is until I understood a little bit better, I thought there was some sort of flashing or even soldering required to get these things to work in my actual PC, which is still kind of the case, at least when it comes to modification, but it's not as dramatic as I thought. Nowhere near. No. So I actually have 14 of these things down in my basement. I bought 14 of these drives because uh, I had a budget for drives and then the easy stores came out and they were half the price. So I was going to buy seven. So I just spent the same amount of money and got twice the, twice the amount. So for those of you that aren't familiar, Western Digital uh, make a series of hard drives called the MyBook the easy store uh there's a a couple of other different names for them but essentially what they are is just a standard sata hard drive in a usb external enclosure that they sell for anywhere from 120 pounds for eight terabytes to you know 14 terabytes for 200 dollars in the states you can get them in europe on amazon and stuff like that um so it's it's not just a us only deal this one which is great The thing that I really like about these drives is they're just a great value. The price per terabyte is as low as you're going to get without going to a shingled storage drive like one of the Seagate Barracudas or something. I got a trick for you, and I'll put a link in the show notes to this sucker. I subscribed to a Telegram hard drive sales channel that just broadcasts. It's just a read-only channel that just broadcasts crazy great deals in storage. Here's a great one, 8 terabytes for 114 U.S. greenbacks. Wow. Yeah, that's not bad. That's great. And so I'll put a link to this in the show notes because you can watch this and then strategically order. And I think that's a great way to go about with storage is order before you need it and just be strategic. But the one thing we didn't touch on, well, there's two things really, but the one thing that I think maybe it's just worth your opinion on is what do you think about the quality of these discs versus buying something that's bare, maybe it costs a little bit more, but it's just that product. It's not inside some sort of enclosure. Hard drive brand loyalty is definitely a thing. I've had drives from Seagate, from HGST, Hitachi, from uh, Western Digital, Samsung back in the day used to make hard drives before that got swallowed up. And honestly, I've had them all fail. I've had all all different manufacturers of all, I've all had a failure on all of them. Um, And I've purchased maybe 25 or 30 drives over the last decade. So I don't actually have a huge amount of brand loyalty. The only one that really stands out for me as being much poorer than the rest is Seagate. Now, if you were to go to Backblaze and look at their quarterly hard drive stats, they have some really interesting data because over the last decade or so, they've actually published a series of statistics from all all the consumer-grade hard drives they've been buying. So their backup service is actually running on top of consumer-grade hard drives, or it certainly was. I think that's slowly moving into the enterprise-type drives now that their business is expanding. But it's really the only major data point on the internet that we have besides people on Reddit going, oh, yes, my Western digital drives died three times in six months. I'm with you, though, on the brand loyalty thing. I've had them all die on me. And a lot of times I've I've found the ones that be in these enclosures to be fairly reliable. I think the manufacturer may spec them for it. So I actually don't think there's much of an issue of quality. Is he going to have to solder, though? No, definitely not. Uh, I say definitely not, and I really hope I'm not proved wrong (laughs) by the time it arrives. Um, My experience has been with all of the easy stores that I've purchased is you you need a couple of guitar picks and a couple of credit cards to pop the case open. No damage, um, takes maybe five minutes for the first time, and then a couple of minutes once you learn where the clips are. 
And inside, there's a small board about the size of a credit card, again, that has a USB 3 to SATA conversion chip on it, and you unplug that, and then you have a normal SATA hard drive. Now, there is one thing to be aware of. These drives respect the 3.3 volt pin reset in the SATA power standard. Now, a lot of people have said that this is a way for Western Digital to quote-unquote gimp the drives, but it's actually part of the SATA spec. So in a data center, when you have racks and racks of these things, you don't want to have to go and pull a drive physically. You want to be able to reset that drive remotely. And the way that these drives do that is as soon as they detect some some power on the 3.3 volt rail is they power cycle. The drive itself basically reboots. Now, most consumer power supplies have a 3.3 volt rail on them. Thus, if you try and connect a consumer power supply to this drive, it will think it's constantly trying to be rebooted. Therefore, your BIOS won't see the drive. There's a very, very simple fix. Get a tiny, tiny piece of Captain tape, maybe two, three, four millimeters across. Put that over the leftmost pins on the power port of the hard drive, and it will just work. Now, I actually made custom power cables and omitted the 3.3 volt cable completely from mine. Uh, I bought some Cable Matters SATA power splitters off Amazon and, and just did it that way. It took me half an hour. Um, but there is a great video from the Bite My Bits YouTube channel, which we'll have a link to in the show notes, about how to put Captain Tape over the power pins of your Easy Store hard drive. One thing to note with these is you don't always know exactly what type of disc you're getting in the enclosure. I mean, you might know if you get a Western Digital enclosure that it's going to be a Western Digital drive or a Seagate or whatever, but you don't necessarily know what type. Western Digital like to sell you lots of very similar products with lots of different colored stickers on the front. So they have dip, they have green for energy efficient drives. They have blue for standard desktop. Red is NAS and then they have Red Pro, which is for NAS Pros users. I don't really understand that one. Yeah, not 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 just regular NASs, but serious NASs. Well, the difference is standard red is 5400 RPM and Red Pros are 7200 RPM. Yeah. Those red drives apparently have special firmware that deals with TLER resets better for RAID users. Give me a break. That sounds like marketing to me. I mean, maybe. It, it, you know, sometimes they lack features on, intentionally just to make you buy something different. I mean, that's not uncommon in the industry. <laughs> no, shock. That's not, that's not like marketing, is it? And there's purple for surveillance as well. So obviously you need a different type of hard drive for surveillance than you do for just storing movies or whatever. Um, now the drives that come inside these easy stores, there's an awful lot of conjecture online as to what's in there. The only thing we can be absolutely certain of is that they're what are called white label drives. Now, most people say that they are probably rebadged reds or drives that were supposed to be a larger capacity that didn't meet QC control. And so they just, you know, let's say it was going to be a 14 terabyte drive and only 11 terabytes was usable. So they slapped a 10 terabyte sticker on the front of it and... We've no real way of knowing, honestly, but there's an awful lot of good information over on the Data Hoarder subreddit if you're curious about this sort of stuff. Oh, that's a great resource. I forget about that subreddit. My thought was they wouldn't necessarily want to put low-quality components in there because that just is going to create a support and brand nightmare. And a lot of people use these as backups, have them just connected to the PC running 24-7, so they they must take that into consideration. Who really knows? Right, and that's that's it. You know, I I don't really worry too much about an individual hard drive failing anymore because for me, an individual hard drive failing is just an annoyance because I have stuff backed up everywhere else. Because I've been through that pain of having a drive actually fail and losing stuff. It's not something you want to happen twice. Yeah, I agree. That's tricky though. When budgets are tight and the amount of data is a lot, it's tricky. It's tricky when you want to duplicate it. So I can kind of, I can understand wanting to measure twice and cut once. While we're talking about hardware, though, I understand you got a device that I have toyed with the idea of getting over the years, and it's the HD Home Run, which I, I think is a pretty slick little device, but I'm curious what your thoughts are. Yeah, it's really interesting. It's a network-based TV tuner. So effectively, it has a, a TV tuner and an Ethernet jack on it. It's about the size of 
maybe a deck of cards and a half. That's a terrible way to measure something, but it's not very big anyway. I'm an old man. <laughs> maybe a, maybe a couple of CD cases stacked on top of each other or something. Now I'm really an old man because I'm talking about optical media. <laughs> yeah, <you're, laughs> you know about the it's so it's about the size of a VHS. You're saying there, Alex? <laughs> <laughs> no, a Betamax. <laughs> That's before my time. I tell you what. So I was wondering, you got there's because there's different kinds, right? But the HD Home Run's pretty famous for their network one. And my, I, I mean, I'm really new to this whole area, but. It seems like you could also get ones that like hook into the back of equipment. There's a whole different kind. I just got the one that has two tuners built into it and receives over-the-air broadcasts. Uh, I wanted a way to watch my local TV station for news when there's like a hurricane coming or, you know, stuff like that. Because YouTube TV is kind of expensive. Yeah, it is. Uh, so can I just go through your setup? Do you, have a, do you have an antenna on the roof or what's that setup like? Uh, I went to Best Buy and spent $20 on a flat... It's about the size of a sheet of A4 paper, and it sticks on the wall in the closet behind me. And that that wall is an outside facing wall. So it's, you know, American houses are made of cardboard, so it's no problem to go th- to get the signal through the that wall. <laughs> I hope yours. I hope your home isn't made out of cardboard. Um, <laughs> Compared to the brick and slate of a British house, is what I mean. Yeah. How far from the transmitter are you? Did you look that up? Uh, yeah, it's on the south side of Raleigh and I'm on the north. So it's about 15 to 20 miles or so. So it's a decent throw. Now this thing, I was expecting to have to, you know, go into Plex and then find the IP address of the HD home run and then sign in and create an account and do all this kind of stuff. And, and so I plugged in the HD home run in the closet, plugged it into the ethernet jack, downloaded the HD home run app on my phone and the instant, and I mean the instant I opened the app, I was watching the NFL. No account creation or... I didn't have to configure. I didn't have to scan. Nothing. It was wonderful. That is really nice. So it must be doing some sort of DNS magic there so it can discover it. Does Plex find it all right then too? Plex has a live TV and DVR section in your server settings. So you simply go into there, click the button that says add device, enter the IP address of the HD home run, and then you're done. It's unbelievably simple. One of my favorite things to do in the RV when I get to a new town is throw up the old antenna, do a scan of all the local HD, and just blast through the local television, get a flavor of the area. That's part of travel, isn't it? Yeah. We were in Wyoming this year at Yellowstone, and I I, I quite enjoyed watching the coal miners complaining about how coal is a dying industry. And I'm like, yep, it probably is. Burning dead dinosaurs is not sustainable. Go figure. Mm Mm-hmm. And as somebody who's kind of into production stuff, I love watching the styles and all of that stuff. So I've always wondered, maybe if I put one in there and, you know, just, I, I don't know, I, I, I love it. And there's always that little news bulletin about iguanas falling out of trees. Did you see that about in Miami this morning? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> it went down to like 40 or something overnight. So everyone in Florida's freaking out. That's the end of the world. Yeah, the iguanas don't like that. That's for sure. <laughs> so uh, first impression's pretty good. How long have you been running this thing? Uh, a couple of weeks now. Yeah. I mean, we don't use it a whole bunch. It's it's just there as a, oh, I want to watch the local NFL game just to, you know, see what's going on. I've got friends over or whatever. I really do feel like I am not getting the value from my YouTube TV subscription. It's nice right now with all of the news that's going on. So I've probably been using it more heavily than I ever have before. But for most of the year, once or twice a week, I turn it on just to check something. I can't stand live TV. Yeah. So awful. See, I got YouTube TV last year for the Formula One stuff that's on ESPN, but the Formula One TV, F1 TV stuff is getting a bit better. You know, like MotoGP is the gold standard for that kind of thing, and or the uh, MLB one. And uh, it's, the Formula One's still got some catching up to do, but it's it's getting there. And, and YouTube used to be like 30 bucks, and then it went to 40, and now it's like 50. And Yes. That's too much. Well, Alex, congratulations. I'll check in a little bit and see how you like it. See uh, see how the DVR stuff works, all that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. What do you say we talk about something that I got stuck? I got stuck in like a time loop this week, installing WordPress over and over and over again. <laughs> and it seems like you have spent some time since we last got together thinking about self-hosted blogging platforms like Ghost, which I am intensely interested in. I was deploying different WordPress scenarios to kind of just get a feel for my different options. So I just got out of this. So I'm really fresh on all of this stuff. And I think I've walked away with a favorite, depending on your usage. 
I used to use WordPress quite a while ago. The beginning of my open source journey, so to speak, was writing down everything I was doing on my blog so that I could remember how I did it so that next time I wouldn't have to go and Google, you know, 15 different Stack Exchange or Stack Overflow posts to figure out how to compile a kernel and that kind of thing. That then led into a few people noticing what I was doing on the Unraid side of things, which led into the creation of LinuxServer.io. So I, I moved my personal blog from WordPress to the Linux Server IO site, and then um, Ghost came along, and uh, I switched out the Linux Server blog to Ghost, probably 2014 or so, and we imported all of the WordPress stuff back then um, that I'd accumulated from my personal blog, and there was a bunch of cruft in there, some of which has been deleted, some of which is still there. And I think my favorite for a long-term simple solution is Ghost because I've used it for probably five years, maybe more at this point. It's dead stupid simple. It uses almost no resources. They've constantly improved the product. Um, it's free. They they provide a Docker for me and it's just it's just great. You know, the, the interface is clean and simple. The themes are pretty good. I can now do galleries of images and it's a markdown editor. What what more do you want? Yeah, that markdown aspect is what initially caught my attention. It's also it checks a few boxes. It's MIT licensed, so it's free. It's coded in Node.js and it's so it's a, which you know, server side JavaScript engine, so it's all essentially one big running application on the server side from my understanding. Um and it also uses Ember.js as the admin client, so there's an interface that's powered by that. You get analytics, it's got all of that in there. I, I was looking at WordPress simply because I'm thinking about doing side podcasting as a creative outlet and just want to have something that ties in really nicely with some of that infrastructure. And WordPress plugins are still the golden standard in that area when you're working with podcast hosting services and whatnot. It's all about the WordPress plugins. However, I, I wonder I wonder if it wouldn't be worth rolling it myself just to, to use something like Ghost. Isn't WordPress really insecure though i think that's kind of unfair i mean i think any large open source project has vulnerabilities i say if you if you go wordpress you go with a commitment to keep it current and you got to build your system in a way that allows it to stay update and if you can't keep it up to date yeah you probably shouldn't be using wordpress maybe you shouldn't be using ghost either then maybe or hosted wordpress i suppose I mean, let's let's be really frank about this. Before I tell you what my, my solution is, I think it's really important that we talk about the reality here. Not only do you need to keep your CMS up to date, but if you're hosting on a VPS, you, you've got to be committed to some security practices like updates, perhaps something like a firewall. I think DigitalOcean actually make this so simple that it's, it's not any more complicated than doing a Squarespace, in my opinion. Um, Obviously, you need to understand a little bit about Docker and maybe Docker Compose um, and understanding, you know, how to create a container. But beyond that, if you can SSH and, and set up SSH keys and stuff like that, I think, generally speaking, there's a few features that DO offer, such as their firewall, their backups and snapshots and that kind of thing, that make it a pretty safe option. Um, I've been hosting mine on DO since I started, so 2013, I think. And... Uh, just on the $5 a month droplet. And it's just been pretty reliable. There's been a couple of minor outages, but it's been pretty good. This go around, I tried Linode. I, I've, I've always been following the company, but uh, was really happy with DigitalOcean. This time around, I thought, you know, if I'm doing a side project, doing a hobby thing, I should make it totally separate, totally isolated from the, from the JB stuff. So I used this as an opportunity to try out Linode. And I'm happy to say I was impressed. Performance is pretty good. They have a lot of the same snapshotting and automatic backup features uh, that, that you'd come to expect. And uh, they'll let you add an SSH key at the time of spin-up, which I think is such a great feature. Very valuable, yep. It's the way to do this. It is really the way to do this. Um, but they also have something else that DigitalOcean don't have, and that is these stack scripts that the community writes that then get voted on and you get a number of deployments. And one that I noticed was Open Lightspeed's WordPress stack script. So I took a look at what they're doing here, and I thought, well, what's this about? Open Lightspeed is, um, I guess, at a high level, it's a, it's a Nginx Apache alternative. 
and um, it is combined with a caching engine. So it's a web server that works in conjunction with a cache that runs in memory, and they're aware of each other. And then it's also working in conjunction with a WordPress plugin. So WordPress is aware of this cache and uses that cache for its assets. And this little plugin generates a static version of WordPress and then puts the assets in the cache, and it makes it very fast. It makes it so fast. And this stack sets up an 1804 uh, Ubuntu LTS system. Statically hosted WordPress, huh? They claim it's 300 times faster than a standard WordPress install. I don't know if that's true, but it's noticeably faster. And the other thing that I really appreciate about this is that script is all laid out for you to go through. Because I also want to make this point. The other thing that was a little disappointing to see is the most popular stack scripts are the ones that install these really awful control panels that are supposedly giving you one-click deployments. Yes, I realize I've just advocated for a script. You have to just kind of take each with its own, and it's it's all sort of an individual basis. But I, I want to kind of caution against that. If, if you're going to take the step of hosting it yourself, I strongly recommend you understand how to set it up. Earlier when Alex was saying you should probably know a little Docker Compose and how to set up a container, that's his way of saying you should go all the way through the process of installing the OS and doing these in containers so that way you can properly manage them once you understand that. And if that feels overwhelming to you, and there's nothing wrong with that because everybody's at a different level, you may want to look at hosting options that manage some of that stuff for you because it will become a nightmare. It'll, be, it'll become something that you need to take care of when you're super busy and you've got other stuff going on. A uh, family friend of mine just had their business website hijacked. It was on an old GoDaddy WordPress site that GoDaddy doesn't auto-update. They update the OS, but the application level updates are on the customers. And um, so their customers were getting sent to a bogus pharmacy website when they came to visit their website, which is in the restaurant industry. And it took them over a week to get it back and getting me involved to help them recover it. They just they, they, it's just updating their WordPress install doesn't come on their mind frequently. And I, I think, I think it had been over nine, 10 months since they'd done an update. Yeah. If you're not that way inclined, it's very easy to let that thing get out of hand. Just think about the reality of what Chris just said. You know, if, if you've put your heart and soul into a blog for six months, 12 months, years, and it suddenly went away and you didn't have a backup of that thing, how would you feel? And is that feeling worth a few bucks? Maybe. Well, Alex, this just might turn into a corner because there's probably a lot of things we could talk about, a lot of tips, and the audience probably has a few ideas. So if we, if this is an area you'd like us to explore more, they need to give us some, give us a, a nudge. <laughs> we need to come up with some other blogging platforms as well because I know there's Jekyll. I mean, there's hundreds, hundreds. Yeah, I like Ghost. You like WordPress, but there are loads of others. And feel free to let us know because those are the two we have the most experience with, but doesn't necessarily mean they are the best. I have a Project Off-Grid update. This Sunday, we head down to the Eugene, Oregon area for the big install. I've decided to go ahead with it. Just a reminder, we're getting about 500 watts of solar installed. But ultimately, another thing we're doing is we're just redoing the entire factory setup of the electrical system, going from a modified sine wave to a pure sine inverter and converter and char a new charge controller, upgrading the alternator, putting all of the plugs in the RV on the system instead of just about four or five of them. So it'll be a whole house. And getting then getting, I've been told, thanks to our awesome audience who's been sending me great information, that it is very likely there will be a way I can pull the, the, the data off of the Victron inverter unit and bring it into Home Assistant and Grafana. It seems like it's likely. I don't have a clear path yet, but the audience was all over it. It's very good. So you went for it, huh? Good for you. I'm very nervous. I'm very nervous because this is the largest work we've ever had done on the RV. I got them to agree to uh, walk me through some of the work they're doing and explain it to me and let me interview them, which I might use for a future project, uh, and help me understand some of it. So it's going to be something like 15 to 20 hours of labor on their part, plus them explaining and, and letting me do interviews on top of that, which they're doing that for free. 15 to 20 hours doesn't sound that bad. I mean, is, that, is that multiple people? I assume. 
That's great, though. That's going to give you the capability to do everything we talked about last episode then. Yes. And the thing that uh, the risk I took is they advised that I put more than 500 watts of solar on there. And I said to them, here's the thing. I'm in the Pacific Northwest most of the time. I've got a really big generator on board. What if I kind of balanced it and went a little more on the batteries, but supplement it with the generator? We'll see. I could be wrong. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask them to wire it for more panels in the future so I can add them if I need to. Super cool, man. I'm so pleased with you for doing that. It's a big decision. Oh, stop. It was. It was. We'll see. It's a lot of money. And uh, it's your house going into the garage for how long? For a week. For for five days. For five days. Oof. I have to live somewhere else. Got to clean the fridge out because there's going to be no power. So I can't stay in it. Got to pack Levi up and I don't know. Maybe I'll sleep on the floor in the studio. <laughs> I think Levi would approve, though, because it means he can go on lots of cool road trips. I, yeah, yeah, for sure. He, he loves that stuff. So how many times, Chris, have you had a smart bulb in your life and you've said to a guest in the studio or something, OK, I have these cool bulbs. Don't use the light switch. All you have to do is X, Y, Z. Yeah, to the point where we even tried taping over the light switches and wrote on the tape, don't use. <laughs> yeah, we've all been there. So I think I have a solution to this issue. And um, I want to get to a bit of feedback from Primoj Kankar. I really apologize if that's incorrect. I think you nailed it. Yeah, okay. Well, we'll see. <laughs> Alan at jupiterbroadcasting.com. <laughs> if I'm wrong. <laughs> a classic. The gist of the feedback is uh, I'm looking to get into some simple home automation. Can you give me some pointers of what I might need to buy and set up? I want to do a smart light switch. Do I need some kind of hub? I've heard you talk about the tech in plugs. What sort of stuff do I need to know? So I came across a really interesting device this week called the Shelly. The Shelly Cloud is the name of the company. The one that I purchased was the Shelly 2.5. Now this thing is about the size of an Oreo cookie. So it's pretty small and it has in it two little relays and uh, this thing goes in the back of a light switch and you wire it up to your 110 volt or 220 volt or whatever it goes on mains voltage so be careful please don't electrocute yourself if you try to install this thing if you're not sure consult a licensed electrician okay disclaimer out the way um now this thing you can flash tas motor onto it so I'm immediately in love with it. It has some little headers on it and the headers on it aren't the standard size that you would normally have for like a breadboard type device. So you need to like strip a network cable or something and then jimmy rig that into your breadboard and flash it with the FTDI adapter that way. But once you've got TAS motor on this thing, it's a case of just wiring it up to the switch and then adding it in Home Assistant like you would any other TAS motor device. But where the real magic comes is this thing lets me use the existing light switch as well as having Wi-Fi control of the light bulbs. Okay, that's awesome. So you just pop open the light switch panel. What, unwire unwire the switch, wire this sucker in, wire it all back, and you're done? Pretty much, yeah. You've got to add a couple of extra wires um, because okay. the way this works is it disconnects the light switch from the light itself which sounds a bit counterintuitive but the relay inside the shelly is what does the switching on and off of the light that makes sense and there's some circuitry in this little thing that detects when you flip the light switch physically and then it also flips the relay inside the box automatically when that happens but you could override it even with the switch down say if that's the off position traditionally you could still turn it on via wi-fi and home assistant the light switch just becomes a physical toggle it also works with three-way switches um, I think we call them two-way in Europe and three-way here. But the other really great thing about this device, besides the fact it works on 110 through 240 volt AC, is it works on 24 through 60 volt DC. Yeah, yeah, that I'm noticing and thinking, this is how I could make my built-in lighting smart. And the 2.5 in particular has energy monitoring, so you can feed that into Grafana and Home Assistant that way. And I tell you what, it's it's a game changer, you know? This house has like, I, don't, I haven't even counted, a lot of light switches. These things cost about 25-ish dollars each. And, you know, what's the cost of a single smart bulb? It's going to be at least 20. Oh, at least. And it doesn't solve the light switch, physical light switch problem. It was when my mother-in-law came to stay last year and I heard her saying, OK, Google, turn off the in lights. 
people don't know the names of your whatnots and all of that. And I've thought maybe I should put like a map on the wall that explains this stuff. But this just takes it completely out of the equation. This is so elegant. It's beautiful. I really want to put this in the RV. Alex, you gotta help me put this in the RV. We do like a project. Pop them off, put them in there. Well, we'll do we'll do some stuff like this around Linux Fest Northwest, huh? Oh yeah. This is so cool. So it's the Shelly 2.5, and we will have a link to that in the show notes. And uh, check out Alex's Twitter feed for a picture of his install if you want to get an idea of what it looks like. Maybe drop a link to that in the notes too. At Ironic Badger on Twitter. Yeah, they have a whole range of products. I'm looking at this stuff. They have some they have some really cool products at uh, Shelly.cloud. So, I mean, once this thing's been flashed, it's yours forever, too. So you can just leave it in the wall forever. Correct. <laughs> I love it. They make some really cool stuff. Energy monitoring. They make an RGBW Wi-Fi LED controller, so you don't have to make your own custom one of those like I did. Temperature and humidity sensors, flood and temperature sensors. I mean, honestly, the list is is pretty amazing. And uh, they've got a whole bunch of stuff coming out in the future. Dr. Z's, you know, that guy in the home assistant community, the floating bald head dude. He loves these things, as does Rob from the hookup. So there's, there's, a, there's a good community growing around it. And if it can run Tasmota, I, I don't really care what Shelley do in five years. It's, it's mine. It's mine now. Thank you. <laughs> I just... I love that. It's yours forever. Well, and until the device dies of natural causes. Uh, okay, so we got to do something a little different now. So just a reminder, selfhosted.show slash contact. But we need to flip it around on the audience, don't we, Alex? Yeah, it's uh, who wants to be a millionaire, million dollar question, ask the audience time. Yeah, let's see what they say. Yeah, so I, uh, I, got, a, I got my drum kit out finally, and... Um, I'm able to play drums in this new house for the first time in 13 years. So I'm super excited to be able to play drums again. And one thing I'm looking for that as a teenager, I really wanted my parents to be able to do was listen to the music that I was drumming along to. So they're not just hearing the blatting of a a drum with no context. So one thing I'd like to try and do, and I hope the audience can come up with a decent solution for this, is to pipe the music that I'm currently playing from Spotify through the house whilst I'm drumming so my wife can listen to it. And that can either go to a Chromecast audio. I mean, it has to be in sync. That's the thing. Otherwise, it's kind of pointless. Maybe the Google Home Minis would be nice. Uh, Again, sync might be tricky with that. What's the source that's coming to your headphones? What's the source of that? At the moment, it's a pair of Bluetooth headphones. You could solve the sync issue by having you both listen to the same source, potentially. I would be willing, I think, to, you know, have like a, a... a laptop next to me and play the music from the laptop instead of my phone and then use that to maybe route the audio because I've got Linux everywhere in this house. I can route audio through Pulse over the network, I think. Um, There's lots of different ways that I could do it, but I'm just wondering if anybody else has solved a similar type of problem and could let us know. Yeah, that would be really cool. And um, while we're at it, I'd love to hear what people are using for self-hosted wikis and notes app, something that's nice to use with decent search, that fuzzy style search, and ideally, both Alex and I were thinking this one, no database, ideally. I really like my Markdown system, but it's it's not really approachable by the spousal unit, and she wants more search, where this was more of a documentation, and I realized she's using Evernote today, and I thought, gosh, I know I could fix, I could solve that with something. I just don't know quite what. Yeah. I mean, I've tried Nextcloud Notes with QO Notes and a bunch of other stuff. I do like it, but I don't think it's perfect for her. I think Nextcloud has a lot of great solutions, but I would prefer not to have to run all of Nextcloud to solve this. Congratulations to them on their Nextcloud Hub announcement, by the way. It is one of the, uh, it's like one of the classics of the self-hosted applications now. It's in that, it's in that league. <laughs> it is, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's almost so big. It's too big to fail, so we almost don't mention it enough. But Nextcloud is great, and I use it every day. Well, we've mentioned links in notes a lot, but we haven't said where you can find them, so we should probably do that real quick, selfhosted.show slash 11. And then what do you say we give a shout-out to our buddy Brent, who's just cranking out these brunches? Man's busy. And they're delicious as well, those brunches. Yeah. He recently did one. He sat down with Jim Salter of TechSnap and Ask Technica fame. So be sure to give that a listen on extras.show. And you did one with him on his Wi-Fi setup, like a self-hosted mini episode. So that's over on extras.show as well. It's worth checking out. He skipped the Ask SSHQ. 
<laughs> and went right to the tech support line. And what I love about you two is let's hit record and make an episode. It was great. And uh, it, <laughs> now you get to learn about some Wi-Fi stuff, which I, I really enjoyed. Well, I think that's everything for today, Alex. As I said earlier in the show, I'm on Twitter at Ironic Badger, and you can find this fine podcast at Self Hosted Show. Yeah, I'm at Chris LAS, and the whole network is at Jupiter Signal. Thank you for joining us, and we'll both see you in two weeks.